Um, anyways, uh, welcome to uh, Puppy Pandemic, Re uh, Raising Puppies in a Pandemic. Um, I'll just introduce myself first. I'm Mike. I'm a trainer at the uh, dog classroom. I know some of you guys have been in my class before. Um, I just recently got um, a new puppy. Uh, he's right over here. I'll grab him just one sec. Come here, bud. Come on. Oh, and he's a moose already. Oh. So this is Augie. Hi, buddy. Yes, you're going to eat the mic. This is Augie. Oh, kisses. Thanks, buddy. He is. He's three months old. Um, he is a huge moose. And uh, this is everything that I've been doing for the last month. And I'll explain exactly. <laughs> I'll explain exactly what that means in a minute. <laughs> Can't really keep him up here too long. Let's see, you guys won't have anything coming for me. Um, anyways, so really what we want to go over today is, um, <laughs> yeah, he's a big goof. Uh, it's just trying to think about what we do when we're raising a puppy and, you know, I'll, I'll touch base on some things about, uh, um, what to think about during a pandemic and all that really pandemic or not. Augie. <laughs> uh, really pandemic or not, there's some basic information that I really want you guys to think about. Um, well, uh, um, while we're going through this and I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of information. Um, sorry, I'm just asking for my wife to come and grab him now that he's been introduced. Um, a little bit of information to start off with, and then we'll kind of open up for questions here. Um, because some of this information that I'm going to give you, uh, really is the basis for what we do um, with puppies in general, um, and the pandemic doesn't change too much with this. Uh, so we'll get right into it. The first thing that I really want to talk about um, <clears throat> is uh, learner theory, learning theory and kind of how that is the basis for all types of training. Uh, learning theory is the scientific theory that, uh, um, you know, we base all learning from now. Now this is dogs, this is people, this is everything. Uh, everything that I say from here on out will be for dogs. Um, you might be able to gather some of it and use it for kids and all that. I know I do, uh, but it really is for dogs. Um, another thing that I want to preface all this with too, uh, when we get into it is, um, you know, if you are having issues, if there's any, uh, uh chance that, you know, when you're using some of these things that we talk about, that there could be some injury to individual or to the dog itself hire a professional. We always have um, consultation services. We even do some online consultation services for certain types of consults. Uh, oh, the video keeps pausing. Hopefully you can still hear my audio. Um, with uh, uh, online uh, consultations, we can do as well. So if there is any issues like that, uh, don't just try to keep working through it. Get in touch with a professional dog trainer so they can help you um, solve some of these issues. But anyways, um, in learning theory, we really want to think about uh, two main things that uh, can kind of frame how we go about uh, bringing a dog, a new puppy into the world, right? One thing that we want to think about is classical conditioning and uh, what that means to dog training. In classical conditioning, uh, if you've ever um, read anything about it, basically, uh, the environment teaches you things, right? It's it's a passive way of learning. Um, something happens in the environment, it's beneficial to you, you learn from that. Um, there's another uh, thing that we talk about, um, which is operand conditioning. And this is the way that we interact with the environment and we learn how we can change the environment. Now with dogs, that happens as well. And one thing that I really want to point out about classical conditioning with uh, dogs is they're always learning. So if you're not taking part in helping them learn, they're going to learn whether you like it or not, right? So we really want to think about that when we're bringing puppies into the world uh, and know that they're always going to be learning. Now they can do things, see the results, learn from that, operand conditioning, 
right? Or things can happen uh, naturally and they can actually learn that when this thing happens that isn't done by me, these other things are a consequence to that or something else that happens. And I may like or not like that and I can start pairing those things together. So what does that mean? Well, when you are bringing a puppy into um, your house, you got to think about management first, right? Always start with management. You got to make sure that these puppies are going to actually make good decisions as often as possible. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, that means puppy proofing the house. You got to go through the whole house. You got to, um, you got to, you know, bring things that are at puppy level, bring them up so they can't access them. You got to make sure that, um, um, you have a space that they can explore that you have control over so they can make some good decisions, only have their toys in there, those types of things. Um, and really if you are managing them properly, they can make a lot more good decisions for very few bad decisions, right? Things that we don't want them to do. And then from there, when they make these decisions, they re realize that there's good things that happen to those with those decisions and they continue to make good decisions over and over again, right? So that's classical conditioning at work, teaching them that all of these different things that happen in my world, um, good things happen if I keep doing these things, right? And then they, once they've explored the world enough, you can start expanding those world, that world. And that's where we talk about uh, doing something like uh, keeping them on leash or having a puppy play den in your in your house so that you have this really strict control of their environment uh, and you can make sure that they're making good decisions all the time. As they, as they get a little bit older, you can start expanding that environment so the puppy play den instead of an X pen being inside an actual um, uh, room only and maybe their crate. You can expand it to a whole room with some baby gates and then expand a little bit further. And whenever you're venturing outside of the puppy play den, you can have them on a leash or know that you can also keep very close eye on them. So me personally, I don't use the leash technique in the house, but I'm exhausted for the last month of running around whenever Augie is in a space that's new to him because I'm constantly there making sure that he's making good decisions. Uh, keeping things away from him that he shouldn't have, luring him away from certain things that uh, he's going to get into that I want to actually um, take that opportunity as a training moment, those types of things. But I tell you right now, I'm, I'm exhausted. It's been a month and a couple of days. And uh, the first three weeks was probably almost all the energy that I had. Um, and if my wife was on here, she would say that I was cranky for the last couple of weeks um because of that and uh, you know i'll just be honest it's a lot of work and that's what the puppy play den's really for right once we go from there and start exploring um, other things besides just getting them situated in the house what we want to really focus on is uh good hab our good um routines right so we want to understand what our dog needs right and fulfill those needs uh, appropriately and try to get them into a routine that works uh, in um, in our environment, right? So uh, we got to get them on a feeding schedule. Free feeding makes uh, um, a lot more things difficult, like being able to potty train and all that type of stuff. Um, but we want to get into those routines. And then that way you can actually really be successful at managing as well, because you'll know when your dog needs to go to the washroom, you'll know when they need to nap, um, you'll know when they need a little bit of exercise, those types of things, once you really build a routine. So something that a routine looks like uh, at the beginning is small, right? Uh, puppies usually, they wake up, they eat, or maybe pee and poop first, then they eat, uh, or flip it the other way. They do a little exercise and then they sleep. That's a routine. Get that routine going and use that. Every time they're awake, you're gonna do that routine, right? And then maybe they're, uh, you adjust it a little bit by putting them in a crate whenever they're sleeping. 
and building on that routine. And then they're going to change in a couple of days and they're going to explore a little bit more. They're going to stay awake a little bit more. They're going to maybe eat a little bit more. So you adjust your routines from there and try to keep focus on those routines so that you can plan things out and still continue to have um, good decisions from your puppy as often as possible, right? So let's talk about that potty training a little bit. If anyone's been in my class before, I've mentioned it, right? Once you know their schedule, you know every time they get up, they got to go to the washroom at least a pee, sometimes a poop. Every time they eat a little bit shortly after, well, they'll eat and drink a little bit shortly after, they got to go to the washroom, right? As soon as they play, they got to go to the washroom. And um, if they get distracted for some odd reason, think that they got to go to the washroom, right? So you're in the middle of play and all of a sudden they disengage from play and they start sniffing around. That is a cue. Take them outside, wait till they go, right? And that way they're making good decisions when they go to the washroom for potty training. They're outside, um, they're, they learn to go outside. They get good praise when they're outside, when they're going to the washroom. And whenever we have accidents inside, we just clean them up, that type of thing. But that teaches them uh, going that going outside is the right thing. And that's what we want to do with, with them, right? Now, um, there's a few other little things that we can talk about. And, you know, if you guys ask some questions, um, we, can, we can definitely talk about them. But I want to get to the one big one. And that's really... Uh, what I think a lot of people come to, um, you know, raising a puppy in a pandemic for, and that's talking about socialization, right? Now, we've all heard it before. Socialization in the first few months is vitally important. Uh, it should actually start right from the breeder. And there's, um, you can Google charts, and I don't know if Amelia will post something with this, hopefully, um that can help kind of guide you on what veterinarians recommend for socialization on uh you know age ranges but you know your breeder um should be or whoever's whelping if it's a rescue and and we're whelping rescue um they should be starting socialization at a young age they get introduced to a whole bunch of different objects and all that type of thing um while they whenever they can um, as soon as they're starting to get vaccinated, uh, if you talk to your veterinarian, um, almost all veterinarians now should tell you that socialization is important. And as long as you're socializing with other vaccinated puppies at the same level of vaccinations, age appropriate vaccinations, that's okay once you get past the eight week mark um, and they get their first set of shots. Um, I think it's a week after that, everything's good to go. Um, Obviously, if you're going to places and stuff like that, um, you'll want to, uh, there's Amelia just posted, I think, in the uh, chat there for the dog classroom, um, one of the socialization uh, charts there. Uh, if you're going to places, you want to carry your puppy when you're in a space that has a lot of uh, activity with dogs. So if you're coming to puppy play school, you can carry them in once you get them in. Uh, that type of thing in a pandemic that isn't possible it's great that you guys have this resource that we have for uh like social media accounts to be able to connect with other people that have uh, puppies but socialization isn't just around other dogs as well it's around everything that they're going to experience in life um, and you can be pretty darn busy socializing them with everything else besides puppies and just getting a few here and there as they're getting vaccinated um, in the first little bit of other puppies and, and working around with them uh, with other puppies, you can be pretty busy with other things as well. So what does that mean? That means hearing, uh, you know, tools banging, uh, cars driving, uh, doors opening and closing, seeing different types of people, all of these different types of things we really want to think about. Um, and if you could think in the first couple of years of their life, right, because hopefully after about two years, they will have experienced full, you know, annual cycle with you going to camp or whatever you're doing. Sorry, I call it camp. We're in Northern Ontario, right? Um, 
were, you know, experiencing all these different things, if you could think through everything that they could experience in that time and try to set them up so they can experience that or something very similar. New experiences are great. We have to watch how they're actually experiencing it too. We don't want to overload our puppies. We don't want to see that they're upset. One vital mistake that people do when they're actually socializing puppies is they see something that is, um, you know, a trigger, something that your, your puppy is a little afraid of, and we just flood them with that experience. And that could actually have the opposite effect. So what we always say when we're teaching anything in in dog class is you start with baby steps. So if you think of, you know, uh, Augie, for example, there's uh, less than a block away, there's a dog that goes outside and in a fenced in yard, can't see out of the yard. So it does a lot of barking whenever there's any new noises in the environment. And it's a loud, loud, deep, it's a big dog. So whenever that dog was barking, you know, we were outside and having our business and that dog would bark and Augie would go flying into the house as fast as he possibly can. Terrified of that noise when we first got him, right? Um, and one of the reasons uh, I know from the breeder is that they lived uh, in a remote farm. So they got a lot of socialization with everything around them, but they only really had a couple dogs around to do it. Right when they uh, were starting that socialization, there was a big snowstorm there and, and they couldn't really go anywhere or anything like that, right? So um, I saw this and it, obviously it, it, you know, there's a little check mark in the brain going, hey, I've got to work on that. But I didn't immediately grab him and hold him outside and try to make him do stuff uh, right there so he can experience it. He went inside, that was it. I put that on the list of things that I've got to work on. And what I did uh, the next time I knew that dog was outside is I went out the front door and I walked a little ways away and I made some noises and uh, seeing if we can get that bark a little bit. And it so happened that Augie got super, super um, uh, uh, scared at that moment and wanted to run back in the house. So I made a note of that. That was too much as well. And I decided to do a whole bunch of other socialization with sounds, uh, all different sorts of sounds. So we got used to all these different things like the blender in the house, the coffee grinder, all of these different types of things um, and got him used to that. And then we tried it again, even further away. And all of a sudden he was okay with that. So we went from there um, and slowly built up and now he can walk around there. We're not up yet to the point that we can walk right up to the uh, fence where he can't see the dog making noise um, or, or the thing that's making the noise. Um, but we can see other dogs uh, further away that seem, that bark loud like that. And we can come right up to them if, as long as he could see them. And that's good enough. And we'll continue to close that gap over time. But that's a perfect example of us not overwhelming our dogs trying to socialize. And we mean well, but we have to make sure that we're paying attention to them. And we understand their needs so we can go at their pace and we can set them up for success. Now. If you're going through your community in your area, there's tons of different things that you'll find there to socialize um, with. I would always suggest that when you're seeing another dog or anything like that, as a puppy, being a puppy out on a short walk, um, you probably want to just stay away from them for now. They're, they're um, vaccinated, but they are a training uh, tool. That's a training moment, right? You can work. Uh, with your puppy just to experience that the dog's around and they don't have to worry about anything moving like that. Yeah, and, and the way that uh, Amelia is mentioning noise sensitivity, that's that's the key. Um, one thing that we, we learn um, with learning theory is generalization happens. Dogs aren't great at it. Um, sorry, let's understand what generalization is. Generalization is if I learn one thing, uh, let's say I learn to do something with my left hand, I could generalize and learn to do with my right hand. Humans are pretty good at those types of things and we can talk things through with each other to help us learn those a little bit quicker. Dogs aren't quite like that. So we just gotta make sure um, that we understand that, but we know that generalization can work over time. Learning theory tells us that I'm pretty sure I'd have to double check this, but I'm pretty sure almost everything can learn generalized uh, through generalization. 
Um, but dogs definitely can with a little bit, if we go at it a little bit slower than what we would with a person. So what does that mean? Well, the dreaded thunderstorms and our, our uh, dogs being uh, terrified of that thunder or fireworks. Well, if you're constantly teaching them that all sorts of noises are perfectly fine and there's nothing to worry about and you start small and slowly build up, Next thing you know, any new noises in the house, there's nothing to worry about from those. And then it's new noises outside, uh, louder noises, thunderstorms and, and loud vehicles and those types of things just kind of fade away and they're never actually a problem, right? Yeah, consistency is important. Um, <clears throat> So I kind of went through Spiel. There's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, I could say extra there, but this is a QA. and um, a kind of framed it for us that we understand that we've got to um, realize that they're constantly learning and the things that we do uh, to get them to learn uh, the right way with management and all of that. And then I kind of talked about socialization. I want to see if we've got um, uh, any questions or anything from here. Yes, using Alexa or using your phone, we actually have a very powerful tool in our pockets now, uh, Kenton. Um, our phone, YouTube, you can, if uh, I actually did this a little bit with Augie, I didn't do it too much because it was a little too distracting for him. But he was, when we first in, um, encountered the, uh, the dog barking scenario in the backyard, I uh, brought him in and I found, you know, a different type of bark, a little bit lighter bark. And I played it on, uh, uh, on my phone on YouTube and you, you can pretty much Google anything or, or, or search anything on YouTube and, uh, you'll find something, uh, audio of it somewhere. So I kind of used that, uh, at first didn't quite make it. And then after we got into seeing a few more puppies and understanding the puppy bark, it, we went to, um, um, uh, going to louder dog barking and everything was okay there. Puppy biting. Yes, that's a good one, Amelia. Um, <laughs> your pup not instigate rough play. Okay, I'll get to that too, Bev. Let's start with puppy biting first. Um, and then we'll go to about rough play and what we do uh, with that. So, um, and, and puppy biting kind of bleeds into that a little bit when you're talking about rough play and whatnot. Ankles of the dogs in the home. Yeah, that's a good one as well. I do have an older dog at home uh, and I'll, I'll very much speak to that uh, in a moment. So puppy biting, what to do? Well, uh, if, this is going to sound weird, but uh, my philosophy is you don't actually want to stop puppy biting because puppy biting is an important role or is something that plays an important role in the development of your puppy they learn bite in inhibition. So when we're talking about when they're engaging with other dogs and that, as long as that other dog is properly socialized as well, or they are puppies and they are growing, the mouthing that they do is perfectly fine. They will give each other feedback and we just have to worry about the intensity that's happening with our puppy because um, that's something that we work in class, right? When we're playing and anyone that's on here that's been in any of our classes, we break up our play sessions and we bring them down from that super excited, highly aroused state, right? Because they start not listening to each other, right? And and if another puppy whines or something like that, your puppy ha in that moment needs to learn to let go and to not actually bite that hard next time. Right? So what does that mean with us too? Well, it's the same thing. When they bite us, we have to tell them that it hurts, right? We can just, ow, ow, right? Ow, 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 those types of things. We have to show them that what they're doing is not okay, right? And if they don't listen and they're too excited, we need to be able to step, stand up and walk out. That's what um, a puppy play den is really powerful for. If we just stand up and walk away from an interaction where they thought that they were going to have some fun and play with us, that actually sends a very clear message to them that that biting is not acceptable, right? We also do some tools in class with anything but bite. Those are structured things um, that we get you guys to work on as well. 
I do want to, now that that point just came up and it reminded me of something, I do want to point out something though. A lot of things that we show you in class and the way that we do things in class is drastically different than what a trainer would do at home. And I akin it to, um, you know, if you've ever talked to a nutritionist or something like that, or, or you go to a gym and you, you talk to um, a personal trainer and they help you with your nutrition there, they're going to give you a nutrition plan. They're going to give you a structured way to do something. And they do that because they show you something that they know can get results if it's been followed uh, properly, right? But when we're talking about like a trainer at home, we don't do these things structurally. Um, we take every opportunity that we can to actually do some training and we adjust and adapt to the environment uh, and, and that certain uh, scenario to get some sort of training out of it. So that scenario where we're playing and all of a sudden our puppy starts biting us and oh, 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 doesn't seem to work at all. And they just keep getting more excited and more excited. That's our opportunity to give them a real clear indicator that, um, uh, that we are not having any of that. Um, with other puppies and they're playing with other puppies, we have to be involved because our dogs will learn on their own. Remember what I said about classical conditioning and, all, and operant conditioning. They're going to learn whether we like it or not. And if we just let our, jo our dogs play with, our puppies play with our other dogs, fully grown dogs, right? they will get more amped up, more amped up, and then they will learn that they're able to get that amped up and continue playing. And what it means for senior dogs um, at home or just older dogs in general that aren't puppies, usually your other dog will get fed up because they don't play as long as puppies do. And they're going to be very upset about that. And they may actually teach them, the, the puppy, that it's okay to respond and correct really um, forcefully in those moments because they're frustrated. The older dog is frustrated. That's why we have to be part of it. And that's what the puppy play den's all about. When we can't keep, keep um, active watch and keep control of that uh, interaction with our puppy and our other dog, we need to separate them. They need to have their space. We need to respect the other dog that's in the house and know when it's time to separate them there. Um, I want to kind of briefly talk about Bev's um, uh, rough play, ankle biting, that type of thing now specifically. Um, now, when we're talking about that ankle biting and stuff like that from a puppy is generally okay as long as we're working with another dog that's well socialized because they will shake them off, um, they will push them away, they will um, use verbal if they need to, those types of things. Um, but you have to be careful um, if the other dog isn't properly socialized with that puppy um, because the puppy may take it too far and and then your other dog may take it too far. So we have to be careful that there's nice clear communication but there isn't an overcorrection there um, because that may actually uh, change the, the path of learning for your puppy and they may start picking up those behaviors of overcorrecting for things like that. A little bark or a little um, shake off or, or, you know, push them down, that type of thing where the other puppies or the other dog in the house is doing those types of things, that's perfectly fine. Um, there's some nuance that's past that. And if uh, I can't really, you know, we'd have to look at specific scenarios for me to get too deep into that, I'd suggest that we get um, some private consults or uh, if you post uh, videos in our, our, you know, if you're a past student, you can post some videos in our student um, group and maybe we can get some comments from some of the trainers. I know we always like to dissect videos and stuff like that, so you might be able to get some help there, um, that type of thing. Uh, I think that kind of covers a little bit of the other dog in home with separating them. Uh, when we need to, when there's over arousal, those types of things from the puppy um, and instigating rough play, we have to be involved in that rough play. So I think I covered everything for you, Bev. If not, just let me know with another comment there. I'm going to move on to Amelia's uh, common question that she's had before about pinning our puppies down for biting. No, 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 no. All I can ever say about that is you got to stop watching Caesar. I'm sorry. 
that is not the right way to deal with it. And to be quite honest, that will actually have, uh, most of the time will have a very opposite effect. They'll actually start seeing you as an issue and they'll have problem, you'll have problems with them interacting with you. That it goes, that goes with pretty much any aversive that we use, right? Aversives is any, you know, a negative, uh, interaction with our dog. I'm not going to say negative reinforcement or positive reinforcement, because those are actually different words in the, in, from the scientific community. They're actually used very different. They don't mean what the, um, people, um, <clears throat> uh, the layman would use them as it's not that at all. But what I'm saying is, uh, choke chains, prong collars, pinning them, hitting them, smacking their mouths, clothes, all of these different things. They do not do what people think they're actually doing. And they have a different effect with your relationship. Um, so an example that I can give about relationship and what, how that would actually change is right now. And my wife has said this to me, I've, I've got a good bond, uh, with Augie. Right. And the reason why is because all the interactions that he has from me are very positive. Uh, he knows that he can look to me to help solve problems to, to when he's upset, when he's afraid, he looks to me, he comes to me. And this is all because everything that we've done is built this strong bond already. We can have that with multiple people in, in the house and whatnot, but right now it's with me. He moves with me everywhere because he knows with me, he's safe uh, and he's going to have fun when I interact with him. Um, I also give him everything that he needs, right? So he's going to do that. When we start having a, a throwing aversives in there, they start questioning that. And it actually can extremely hamper everything that you do with training in the future, right? So they, when they look at you in a scenario where they come in and maybe they're mouthing you because they're playing and you smack them then they're, or, or sm uh, pin them or, or clamp their mouth closed, they start looking at that as, mm, maybe I don't want to really, really want to interact with this. We just got to guide that, right? We got to make them have better decisions. So we're going to always have um, uh, toys interacting with our play. We're not playing with our hands because if we always play with our hands, the likelihood that they're going to bite us is going to go through the roof. That's managing the environment, right? Now the pinning too, it actually doesn't do much besides know that sometimes when I come over and we're playing, I'm going to throw you on the side and, and hold you down and you may not like that, right? So it, you're really not getting anything that you know, somebody that, um, suggests that is really telling you that you're going to get, you're not getting any of it. Um, Maria, I, or sorry, Marie, sorry. I see meant, uh, jumping on you. We're talking about how about jumping? Yeah. Jumping's going to happen. Uh, puppies, you know, one of the things that they, they learn, uh, very quickly is they get interaction and they get feedback from our faces. Right. So they're always looking up at us and they always want to get closer and they have interactions with us like that. So that a lot of times they're going to jump like that, but they're also going to jump when they see things or smell things that are higher up, uh, that they want access to where consistency is the key here. We want to make sure that we're going to reduce the likelihood that they're going to do it, managing, um, their environment. So for example, um, you know, when I'm in the kitchen and I started this right away, I'm actually planning on posting a little short video on our student group. So you guys that are part of our student group, go ahead and watch that, uh, when it, po when it pops up there, but when I'm in the kitchen and I'm doing anything in the kitchen, I'm going to make sure that he's going to make the right choice instead of jumping up and seeing what's on the counter the whole time they're in there, even though he can't reach the counter yet, I'm already conditioning him. When I work in the kitchen, you're off on your mat on the side, you're over there. I'm going to feed you. Um, when I'm in the kitchen and work, when I'm making supper, they get fed first. So as he's eating, I'm doing stuff that's teaching him to stay away from the counters. And then when he's done, I put him on his mat and I'm tossing treats to him over on his mat as often as I can. And when I can't do that, like I've got to make supper really quick because my daughter has a dance, uh, in a half an hour and we got to go, go, go. 
I'm going to grab him. I'm going to put him in his puppy play den. Uh, I'm going to have somebody with him on leash outside of the room, that type of thing. And that way they're not jumping up like that. Now, when they're jumping up for us, we just got a, a nice, easy thing to do is replace that. And people have heard this before in my class. If you don't like a behavior, replace it with something that you do like, right? Um, Amelia will always uh, bring up incompatible behavior, right? I've heard her say that often, right? You, you're just going to replace it with something that you do like. For example, a sit. So whenever they come to greet us, instead of jumping up to try to get to my face, we're going to get them to sit. And we're going to reward that sit. We're going to reward it with treats, usually at first, especially food motivated. And then we can re reward it with affection or add that layer on affection and verbal affection and those types of things to really reinforce the fact that you don't get anything when you jump up and then you get everything that you wanted uh, when you stay all for a pause and when you really want me you're going to sit right beside me and I'm going to interact with you that way. So hopefully uh, that covers a little bit of the jumping up on you. Uh, reach tables, counters, investigate food. So one thing that I'll say Sheena about um, reaching up on tables and counters and all that. I did mention about managing it where it's a training opportunity and I'm going to push them off to the side onto a, a sorry, not physically push, but they're going to be off to the side. I'm going to teach them to stay on their mat to stay away. When you're not able to do that, you're going to either manage them to make sure that they can't practice that behavior or you're going to manage the environment to make sure that they don't get reinforced when they test those boundaries out. That works with older dogs as well, right? So most puppies are not going to be able to reach the top of counters and all that kind of stuff, maybe except for Bev's new puppy there. Uh, but otherwise, they're not, they're not really going to reach that, but they will jump up and try to climb up the counter and those types of things. We don't want them practicing that because as they get bigger, it will be reaching the, the countertop, right? But just manage those environments. Um, to make sure that if they do happen to get up there, they're not going to grab anything. Anything beyond that kind of um, uh, information, we really would probably best discuss it through um, some sort of um, uh, consult. And, you know, counter surfing, if we have some videos and, you know, we can actually connect and talk to each other, uh, even online, I think we could actually manage that uh, um, that through an um, online consult. So think about that if we need to, if that information just doesn't help you. So that's the best way to teach dog off for the counters and tables if you could. So off, that's an interesting one, uh, Kenton. Off means nothing, just like any other word that we use with our dogs. It means absolutely nothing to our dogs. So if we actually haven't paired that sound off that sound to them to something that means something to them saying that word to get them off is going to take a very very long time for them to get the message i just would not do that personally uh, what I would actually do is I would teach them not to go up to begin with. Then you don't have to worry about the off after they're already up there, right? If you're teaching something like you want them off and you want them to know that word, that's more of a, we want them on furniture and then we need to be able to ask for our furniture back when we need to. If that's what you do, I have a hundred pound plus dogs. None of them go on the furniture. But if you guys are doing that, you teach them the way that we've taught you guys verbals uh, before, right? You just tell them what you want, show them what you want, reward them. You guys have heard that, uh, that have been in my class for anyone else that hasn't think that through a little bit. It's, it's pretty simple. You say something and then you're going to pair it with something that you want them to do. So if they're up on, um, uh, a couch or something like that, you can say the word, you can lure them off. Once they get off, reward them. Once they get down, then they'll start learning what that word is, but just saying it over and over and then shoving them off, whatever they're on, they're not learning that at all. So I wouldn't even go there. I would try to prevent the behavior before it even happens. Once they're up there, it's simply just moving them, use your body, block them, slowly slide them off, make sure they're not going to get hurt, right? Once they're off on the ground, um, we're, we're done with that. Think of a better way to catch that behavior and actually reinforce staying on the ground is the better way to deal with that. Um, Puppies who eat socks. Yeah, uh, Caitlin, the, really, that's a management thing. Um, they shouldn't have access to a place that socks are. 
uh, especially, and this goes for anything with puppies. When they're first in your house, they are exploring everything, right? They need to check out everything and some things are interesting to them and some things are not. And then a couple hours later or the next day, the things that weren't interesting to them are all of a sudden interesting to them. We have to be on our toes and we got to manage the environment and make them make good choices. Often with what I've seen with socks is early, early on, they're really pumped about socks. And as long as we manage the environment for a little while, socks aren't um, inter as interesting. Also, if we teach them at the same time, this isn't managing the environment, but we teach them fun things to play with. So we've got the right toy that they engage with with us. Maybe it's kind of like a sock, but not really, you know, a um, um, plastic uh, water bottle with uh, inside a fire hose that's sewed up nice and tight, you know, something that's a little bit more interesting. We can always redirect them to these interesting things uh, and engage with them in there. And then you're also building your relationship and teaching them to play with toys with you as well. But those socks, once they're in there, uh, we got to get them out. Usually trading works. Um, early on, you get a nice yummy piece of food and you trade up. You could always use a leave it cue just before that if you want. If you've really worked leave it's, that'll work great to actually get the sock out and then you don't have to trade, but you can use the cue and reinforce your cue, those types of things. But in the beginning, pick up all the socks, get a hamper that closes, put it in a closet, manage the environment so they're not grabbing those socks all the time. Uh, let's see what's next here. Chewing laundry to dirty clean. Yeah, clept. <laughs> yeah. So same thing, Haley. Um, seven month old. You're getting. There's still definitely puppy there. A uh, little bit of puppy getting adolescence, that type of thing. But they're still exploring the world, and they're starting to get into the second and third phases of testing their boundaries, right? So at seven months old. Um, we really have to get on top of that. We got to manage the environment as much as possible. And we got to teach them that there's other things that are more fun to play with, right? So with Augie, every day I'm grabbing some toy, something that we have. I'm either, you know, he's got a squeaky toy, a little plush squeaky toy that we squeak, squeak, squeak and uh, kind of play fetch with. Again, I've got some content that I want to post on that. Um, but that we're kind of doing that to do a form of fetch at puppy, um, you know, three month old puppy level. Uh, and then we also have a rope that he can play tug with and we can run around. And I'm telling you, if there's socks on the ground and they've learned that grabbing a rope is fun and you wiggle that rope and run around like crazy and get super excited and call their name, they're going to drop the sock and they're going to come play with you because that's more interesting than a stupid sock sitting in the corner that's not doing anything, right? And then the more you interact with your dog that way and teach them that all of these toys that we've bought for you, because I'm sure all you guys are here, you've probably bought a hundred toys, right? These are the things that actually produce fun. Those things get boring and they start leaving them alone after a while. Now, you know, you still will have to manage sometimes, especially if they get bored and we're busy doing something else. When we get to that seven month old and the puppy play dens kind of expanded to the whole house and that type of thing. Um, but you still have to manage that environment until they learn that those things aren't just aren't fun. So if they're out, they're out. I don't care because there's something more fun. What happens often is those socks are on the ground and they pick them up and we chase them around the house for 10 minutes. Well, how much fun do you think they're having there? That's really reinforcing playing with socks, right? So if we prevent those socks from even getting in their mouth from the right from the get go, they're not going to be reinforcing that, that habit or that behavior. And we don't have to untrain that behavior into something else too. Uh, just tell our puppies no when they do something we don't like. Uh, no, Kelsey coming from Kelsey. Yes. Well, um, so Kelsey, um, a lot of people use no. It 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 falls in that same thing as off. That it's a sound that they don't understand yet, right? And it doesn't really mean anything. But not only that, you're not you're not actually understanding how um, learning works, right? We talk about classical conditioning and operand conditioning. 
with classical conditioning, they're going to learn to do something. If you say, no, just do nothing. When something makes you want to do something, they're never going to learn that. We have to understand that what they're doing is they're acting out. They're, they're acting out based on some sort of stimulation, right? So for example, someone comes through the door, they get really excited and they jump up and down. No, 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 isn't going to do anything to that. We got to teach them what we want them to do instead, something active, something that satisfies that need. So if instead of jumping, we actually replace that with a sit and we reinforce that sit. Now we've actually told them when you feel this thing happen, when you get super excited about somebody coming through that door, go ahead and sit because that's what we want you to do. Right. And this goes all the way through life. Um, puppies, it's a lot easier to train uh, because you're not training out something that they've probably reinforced for some time already. Um, <laughs> uh, Debbie, that's good. Maybe they, you did teach off somehow already, right? Yeah, it's, it is hard with kids. So I have two children right now, uh, nine and 11. So they're a little bit older, um, but I didn't teach them well enough, I guess, because they still leave their clothes around. And yep, they catch it. Uh, those puppies will find it. But if you are really working with that, uh, keeping them in um, your sight at all times, puppy play den when you need to, that type of thing, um, you should be able to minimize getting those socks, those mitts, um, you know, stuff like that, um, because you're staying close to them. So when you enter an environment, a new environment, like a new room in the house, do a scan, take a look. If there's anything on the ground, have a toy, throw it one way, go pick it up real quick and put it where it needs to, or call the kids in to watch the puppy now because they left something on the floor or get them to pick it up or something like that. Right. We really got to think of, um, ways that we can prevent, uh, those things from happening. Cause again, they're always learning. If they, one of the hardest behaviors to change is a self-reinforcing behavior. Now let's talk about this for a second. When we talk about um, self-reinforced behavior, these are usually behaviors that have um, occurred for some time and they've now started um, being reinforcing in and to themselves. So let's talk about the, whenever somebody comes to the door barking, right? Or somebody walks down the street and they're looking at the window and they're pounding at the window, right? So uh, that's a really good one that I could kind of explain everything that happens there. So if somebody's walking down the street, they see uh, out the window that they're coming, they get amped up as they get close, they get super excited, that adrenaline starting to pump in their body, which is reinforcing to them. It's a good feeling, right? And then they start pounding at the window or on the windowsill and that, that physical contact is actually giving them stimulus. It reinforces forces it even further, right? And then this cycle repeats day in and day out, day in and day out. Next thing you know, they've been reinforcing that behavior for months and months and months, and then you're going to try to reverse it. That's why sometimes when we're talking about um, behavior consult in behavior consults and stuff like that, it takes time because we have to undo some of the things that they learned and get them to choose something different that's more productive or safer or something like that, and then really see value in that. And those self-reinforcing ones, the ones that make them feel good just by doing it is really difficult because it's easy to revert back to that. And you're constantly fighting them reinforcing themselves versus you trying to teach them the right thing to do in that moment. If you can get something that is reinforcing, um, more reinforcing than that self-soothing that they're doing or, or self-reinforcing that they're doing, you might have some luck in there, but it is difficult, right? So what we always try to do is, especially when, you know, we're talking about puppy raising here, let's make them make good decisions right out of the gate. And I've always said this to people that come to my class, when we're talking with pu about puppies and they interact every single time they do something, you should take just a quick note, your head off to the side and go, hmm, would that be good if they were at full size, right? So let's take Augie, for example, he's a uh, bull mastiff. Uh, right now he's about 30 pounds. Uh, when he's full size, he's gonna be 120 pounds. Is it okay for him to jump up on the couch? 
Well, at 120 pounds, even if I did allow him on the couch, I wouldn't want him running and leaping onto the couch. He might pop a spring or something. So I'm actually going to see that behavior right at that moment, the first maybe one or two times, three or four or whatever, uh, that he actually does it. And I'm going to go, no, 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 no. Let's do something else here. What are we going to do? When you get that pumped up, go and find your toy, grab your toy. We'll get to play with your toy instead of you leaping up and running across the back of the couch and bouncing around with your zoomies, right? So that's something that we got to really think about because once we get down the road of self-reinforcing behaviors, there's a lot more work, right? I'm not saying that it's impossible to change, but there's a lot more work involved. Uh, are my kids involved with a puppy at all? Yeah, of course um, they need to be. Now, obviously it's got to be appropriate to their um, level, right? Their age level. So uh, we just do some simple things right now. We're going to let them walk them for a little bit when we're in an appropriate state to be able to walk. Uh, we're going to get them to play, but I'm going to teach them how to play. Um, often kids like to play and move their hands around lots and that gets the dog really excited. Um, but it usually sets that dog up for failure because they're going to start grabbing at hands and biting at pants and stuff like that. Um, so we want to really get them to get involved in, in interacting with your puppy, but we want to make sure that we're setting both of them up for success. So teaching them how to play properly with toys. We're going to teach them how to treat properly to minimize any nips on the fingers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of talking about making sure that my kids are going to be engaged as well. I don't want them getting their fingers um, chomp down on and then they are like ah I don't I don't want to deal with this puppy anymore or I, I resent the puppy or anything like that so we got to think of those things as well are they um, having free time when I'm not around with the puppy not really unless I give them a specific specific task to do uh, with them no they're not because I need to be able to respond when Augie's getting too amped up or he shows that he's tired and he's getting frustrated with what's going on or anything like that and if I just leave a puppy in a in a child in a room um, going there's a, a good chance that Augie will start making bad decisions at some point right and that goes with that whole philosophy of trying to make them make good decisions as often as possible. Now, other things that you got to deal with as puppy, like he's a puppy right now, he's 30 pounds, you know, he's, he's, his bite isn't fully developed. Like his, his actual, um, bite down force isn't fully developed. So he's not going to be able to do crazy damage. But if you're having any issues where the puppy gets super frustrated and they're solo in a room, there can be problems, right? You hear about bites in, in the community and, and stuff like that. And we have breed specific legislation uh, that's geared uh, to a specific breed that if managed properly, those bites wouldn't happen most of the time. I can't say all the time because I don't know all the stories, but I know a lot of things that have happened where bites have happened when people weren't supervising. Oh, ooh, anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk about, uh, the anxiety first there, Christy. Um, that, so some things to think about when we're talking about staying home alone, um, and uh, anxiety, uh, there beyond what I'm about to say, I'd really suggest uh, you get in contact with us about um, uh, private consults because there's a lot of different um, um, issues that could be going on, a lot of different things that we can talk about. But what I would suggest with anything with a new puppy in home is we, we do what we can uh, to set them up for success. So shorter uh, lengths of stays, uh, if at all possible, um, often will get them crate trained and get them into the crate, um, to keep them in a smaller confined space. Uh, you know, you can use, um, uh, uh, covers or crates that are enclosed with only breathe holes. That's that type of thing to keep it dark, uh, those types of things. Um, but you really, what you want to do is you want to have nice, uh, good quality times in the space that they're meant to be alone. Um, you need to, um, you need to really work on, uh, having really successful small moments alone. 
uh, and then building up from there. And that can be difficult when you're talking about having to work and having to leave for a certain amount of time. And I'd actually reach out to find some people that can uh, come and uh, get your dog out, get them super um, um, exercised and, and exercise their brain and whatever you can do to really get them so they're going to sleep. Because when they're sleeping, they won't be... A, uh, high anxiety. And then also think about what I said way earlier in this conversation uh, um, about getting routines, because if you can manage your routines um, really well, you can actually, um, you can actually get them to uh, like their crates. I'm getting a message saying that we're frozen. Uh, can you, st can you guys still hear me? If someone gives messages, says that you can hear me. It's okay if I'm frozen, but give me one sec here. Just seeing if you guys, yeah, okay, you guys could still hear. Okay, I'll keep going. Yeah, my frame rate dropped again tanked again uh, I'm all good. okay uh we'll keep going here um <clears throat> sorry i was saying about um that anxiety and getting them if you have a good uh, routine you can actually set up for success you'll know when your puppy is actually starting to get tired and you can take that opportunity as a training moment put them uh in their crate or their confined space that they'll be home alone in let them fall asleep in there, step out for a little bit, come back before they amp up, get them up, get them excited, um, have some good interaction there, and then slowly build that up. Um, besides that, I can't get super into that anxiety topic because it is complicated. Um, and, you know, I, I could probably spend a whole hour talking it through with some back and forth from you so get in touch with us uh, and see if we can actually help you out online um, or when we get back to classes that would be a good question asking class in between classes we have a few more minutes to interact with you uh, if you're in town uh, what's one thing you want someone to know before they get a puppy <laughs> uh, that's a loaded question um, there's a couple different things that I would actually uh, want to make sure to think about. Uh, number one is uh, know that the puppy's going to grow up and it's going to grow up fast. Um, we got Augie at about 10 pounds and he's 30 pounds and within about eight months or so, he's going to be close to full grown size. That puppy phase doesn't last long enough to make a decision on a cute puppy. You have to understand what they're going to be like when they're older um understanding breed is um extremely helpful now obviously there's going to be a group of people here that are getting puppies that are rescues you don't know the breed and all that and you have to understand that you don't know that and that's a vital piece of information that um is a variable right and it could mean that you're getting this puppy um that's as laid back as uh an english mastiff or you're getting this puppy that has the energy of a Sheltie and you're running 24 seven all day, every day. Um, I, I specifically selected a bull Mastiff for a reason. It fits my lifestyle. Um, I needed a puppy. I, I've got a, a, a senior dog that takes about five, 10 minutes of a walk. Now I needed a puppy that, you know, obviously can't be five, 10 minutes, but with a walk and the two kids and all that, you know, 30 minutes at most, maybe a little bit more than that, do a little training session or do some training at supper time. Um, and we're good for that type of interaction. I needed somebody that are a puppy that was going to be portable for the camping that we do and all that type of stuff. So I selected a breed that's going to fit. And, uh, this is my second bull mastiff. So I really know that it, that, that one's going to fit. Right. But you have to understand that puppies, you know, if you don't know the breed, that's a variable and that variable, uh, in, in Thunder Bay, when you're talking about rescues, you're mostly talking about Huskies, uh, we're very difficult to train. Um, some, some of them have a mind of their own. And if you don't get really connected with them early on and get them really motivated to work for you, there's, 
there's some difficulties there. Uh, working dogs are are big in those mixes um, too, like uh, German Shepherds and that. And you know, with that breed, there's there's a lot to think about there. Um, there's a lot of things that happen that generally most people wouldn't select if they wanted to pick it off a list. You know, um, German Shepherds bark at anything new. And they bark loud and they bark often. And, you know, a lot of people come to us and say, how do I get them to stop barking? And I'd be like, well, you know, in the back of my head, I'm like, you probably picked the wrong breed if you don't like barking at all, right? I pick a bull mastiff that that generally doesn't bark at all or will warning bark once or twice, that type of thing. So knowing the breed or knowing that you don't know the breed is really important. Um, they're not uh, uh, presents. Puppies aren't presents. These are living animals. They need things from us. We can't give up on them. Know that you're going to struggle. The first few weeks are going to be hard. And within a couple of months, you're going to be bouncing into adolescence. And that's going to be tough, if not tougher. Um, and know that that's actually part of it when you're, when you're getting a puppy. Know that you've got your work cut out for you. You are not going to be just laid back and, and, and uh, these, these guys are going to learn on their own because if they do, they're not going to learn what you want them to. They're going to learn what they need to survive and what feels good to them. And that's probably going to be incompatible with what you need to know. So um, really think about that. If you're going for breed, like picking a specific breed and buying, uh, purchasing a puppy from a breeder, do your research talk to training professionals they'll help guide you on what to look for for um, uh, good breeders um, if you're getting a rescue check them out make sure that they have good information make um, good information out there about them make sure that they understand how to whelp the work that they got to put in the socialization that they got to put in you know everyone wants to save a puppy but you know what's the point of trying to save a puppy if in six months they end up you know, back at the rescue and trying to find another home. That's just not right. So don't jump in there just because of the cute face. Those are probably the biggest things that I would uh, think about when we're talking about um, getting a new puppy or making a decision to get a new puppy. How do you manage an energized puppy after a procedure like a spay? Yeah, well, so I'm, I I can't really get into specifics about um, uh, health care and, you know, you can talk to your veterinarian on what you need to do um, for that. But crates are great. Um, teaching them early before they're spayed because most vets, unless they do it for uh, like they're balancing risks, they won't do it before six months. So you've got roughly five, uh, sorry, four months of training that you can put in um, to do that. Uh, most of the time, uh, a lot of brain work will actually get some energize, uh, some of that energy out before they um, before they can run around uh, too much. Um, wait your few days, right? Um, start ramping up your exercise as slowly as possible and look for any signs of lameness and talk to your vet. Um, and you can kind of go from there. Most people, you know, we've heard it before in class. Uh, most people, um, they come to class within five days and they're like, oh yeah, this is how they've been for the last three days anyways. So it's not unusual to see um, a puppy shortly after spay being super rambunctious. We just got to, you know, calm them as much as possible to make sure that they don't hurt themselves. Um, what else do we got? Private sessions. Okay. I think that's all of the questions. Is there any more questions that we have? I don't know if I covered everything that I could possibly cover, but we've been going for about an hour and a bit, so we might get some fatigue now, especially if we're in working from home and all that type of stuff. Just wait a moment here, see if there are any more questions. I apologize for the frame rate issues. I'm going to play around with it a little bit more. I, uh, I stole my kid's camera because I usually don't use a camera when I'm on uh, the internet. <laughs> Okay, well, 
hopefully I've given you guys a few things to think about. Um, we'll post some things and uh, uh, I think Amelia is planning to post this video in a couple different uh, areas. Maybe we'll edit and trim it down a little bit or something like that too. If you guys do have any questions, um, you know, if you are a past uh, student, make sure you check out our um, student group. There's lots of information that we uh, will share there. Um, you often get us bouncing in and out. I can't say that we'll answer your questions right away there. Um, but one of the trainers usually gets in there and gives a few comments here and there. Um, always look for us uh, online, posting our new uh, courses and that type of thing. If you guys are um, uh, registered for the next round, hopefully uh, we'll hear a little bit more information from the government. Um, Oh, yeah, we got one more. I think that's a good one. Let's talk about that. Um, our puppy always wakes up and wants to go out all night, every hour. <laughs> Why are puppy training class beneficial? Oh, okay, here comes some more questions. Let's keep going then. Uh, yeah, puppies wake up, um, want to go out every hour. Young puppies will. They will because the way that their life works at that moment eat drink sleep wake up pee eat drink sleep wake up all those different things right um what we want to really do with your puppy is let's manage their their um their food and water intake close to the evening uh, obviously you're not going to make them um you know be dehydrated or anything like that uh, but you can manage that water intake um in the evening uh, closer to bedtime, really exercise them a good chunk right close to the end uh, before you're going to bed and uh, get them into bed uh, and go to sleep at that time too, once you get them settled down um, and see if we can sleep. Often, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a huge believer in crates. So if you haven't crated, there is some changes to uh, some of this that gets more nuanced based on the environment. But if you've crate trained, what you can do um, is teach them to go for all of their sleeps in their crate. And we can slowly build up their time during the day in their crate. And if we're building up their time during the day, usually if you're sleeping and the house is quiet and the crates um, uh, closed, they'll wake up a few times um, and be all right. Uh, some things, you know, one thing that I, I'll say with crate training, and this is often isn't in videos um, that people talk about, um, but it's something that I've had to do uh, a few times with crate training, is they get good with their crate and then they start protesting in their crate. Not necessarily that they have to go out, but that they want out. Um, and often I've had to, um, and I did this with Augie, um, once or twice and then he kind of picked it up pretty quick um is that when i knew that he was full uh like didn't need any food he didn't need anything like that he went out to the washroom he um had both uh poop and a pee uh he's been um exercised and i know all of his needs have been met and we put him in the crate we get him to settle in his crate and if he gets up, I just pop over to the crate. I sit down in front of it and I just sit there right in front of the crate and they're going to whine a little bit um, about protesting to get out. And that's different than I need to go to the washroom, uh, those types of things, because you know you've dealt with all those. Um, and if we work on it um, early enough, they tucker themselves out within a few seconds uh, and they've learned to fall asleep and then you can slowly wean out having to be near the crate um, to do that. Now that happened within the first two weeks uh, of him being here. When you get further on uh, later in life, you have to do more work of prepping that crate to be the place that they sleep. Um, and there's a little bit of changes that ha that go into getting the crate to be the best place. We have to really work on that um, throughout the day and every time they sleep, they go in the crate, we close the crate, they sleep for whatever a couple minutes that they're sleeping. Um, usually if we tuck on them out, you're going to get a half hour or something like that. Um, and then open the crate, call them out. And every time they're going to lay down, we're going to catch them. Don't 
take those opportunities that they're going to give you where they just fall asleep at your feet. And you're like, oh, I've got to do some work now. Take those moments, pick them up, bring them over to the crate, get them used to the crate, that type of thing. If you're in an environment where you're not using a crate, there's a lot uh, more difficulty that you're going to have because generally they'll go to the end of the room or they'll go to the door, those types of things, and, you know, defecate or urinate. Uh, over in those areas and now you're you're actually losing the the potty training game at the same time right so that's where i'm a huge um uh, crate believer uh and outside of that i would need to know a little bit more information to work through that another live when augie's a teen yeah we'll get we'll get to one of those when he's uh um in his adolescence and making me pull out the little tiny hairs that I have left on my head uh, because we know that's coming. Uh, and why are puppy training classes beneficial? Well, from puppy play school, um, you know, they get a lot of interaction with uh, uh, puppies that are vaccinated, so safe interaction. If you can't get that in a pandemic, like right at this moment, I'm hoping we're going to hear some changes soon uh, to the rules in, in Ontario. But if you can't get that, reach out for um, uh, in social media to find some puppies that are okay. And if you know of a um, uh, little bit older dogs that are fully vaccinated, that aren't going to anyone that's going to any sort of dog parks or anything like that, anywhere where they can pick up stuff easily, um, get some interaction with them, manage that interaction. Just like we said before, when I was talking to Bev's uh, uh, question before about uh, another dog in the household, you gotta be in there engaged in that play all the time. It's not just a free for all type of thing. Uh, but that's a big thing that you get out of uh, puppy training classes. We also talk about a lot of different things like, um, you know, teeth cleaning, uh, um, ears and uh, nails and all those types of things. So that's in a puppy uh, level. But um, training in general gives you guys a foundation uh, to kind of use to build your relationship with your dog. And I can't stress that enough. It, it, it's something it, I, I was talking to Amelia about it a, a, a couple months or maybe a month ago. I was trying to figure out how to actually post this so people understood it. But my dog, Augie, he works with me because he wants to work with me. And the only way to get them to that stage is to constantly be working with them and having fun with them, right? So recalls get easier. I can recall him down the hallway in my house right now. It's not because I've actually taught a recall to him the way that we do it in puppy class, but I've done so much work with him. And for people that aren't trainers, when you go to puppy class, there's a wealth of information of actual things for you to look at, to work on that you may not have thought of on your own. And when you actually, when you actually um, get these things in front of you or you get your homework sheets, those are things that you can look at. So just like I said earlier, when you go to a nutritionist, they give you this guide, right? And follow this guide and you know you'll get your results. But in there is bits of information that, that they're trying to share with you on right choice of foods and all those types of things. Well, when we go to puppy class, there's a wealth of information of how to train. What does it mean to train? How do we set up to train successfully? And if we continue to follow that regimen of training our dogs all the time and engaging with them and taking those moments, they learn that we are good stuff and we want to be around you. And it makes it easier to do all the other things that we expect of our dog later, like walking close to us. And instead of charging out to something, you're going to stay close because you know staying close to me is better calling them when they get off leash or something or they get loose you can call them and they'll come back all of these things are so much easier when they see value in just being around you and that's what dog training is all about and that's what our classes can give you when you're not a dog trainer when you can't just look at a scenario and go how am i going to solve this problem this is i know i can do this i can break it down this way and all those types of things we give you that and we give you structures to have some wins what I always say to my group when, when we're in the next step is the next step after that is your dog trainers. You're my trainers now. 
And when you get to that point that you're actually turning into a trainer, I hope that at the end of the next step, the next time you think of something that you want to train with your dog, you can actually figure out how to successfully do that. So you're not stuck going, how do I get this behavior? I need somebody to show me. You're set up to be able to go, this is my goal. I need to break it down into wins for my dog so I can get wins and get me there. So that's what dog training is all about to me. And, and, and really that's what I want you guys to learn when we come to class is just how to engage with your dog, to get your dog to want to work with you and have fun with you. That's the best way to get a dog that's going to fit, integrate into your life and have a good family pet. Right. If you don't do that, we're always looking at them as making mistakes and trying to fix mistakes. And that that's just you're you're coming at it from the wrong wrong angle. I want them to always be with us, engaged and you know, generally can understand what I need them to do in the environments that we bring them into. Sorry, that was a big spiel that came out of one simple question, I think, but uh hopefully that uh that answered it. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Had a huge drop in frame rate. I probably lagged out there for a second. Sorry about that. I will fix that for the next one, guys, hopefully. Um, I think, yeah, we're about an hour and 20 in. I don't want you guys to get too tired here. I'll just leave it for a quick minute here just to see if there's any last questions before we finish up. If you guys do um, uh, see this posted and you want uh, other topics uh, to be covered or something a little bit more in depth or anything like that, feel free to uh, let us know uh, by commenting um, or you can always send an email. Um, you'll see our contact information on the website, www.the.classroom.com. Uh, you can hit us up on uh, uh, Facebook as well. Um, let us know what you guys uh, are looking for and we'll see if we can help you guys out.